This is 6.3 Skeletal Muscle Activity Notes. The essential question is, what are the structures and steps involved in muscle contraction? Motor neuron is a nerve cell that specifically controls skeletal muscles. And skeletal muscles are under a voluntary control, that means you control it. One motor neuron can stimulate many muscle cells at one time. And muscle needs to be uh, have a nerve impulse generated by a motor neuron in order to contract. A motor unit is made up of one motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that inner innervates. Innervates the word that means that the nerve impulse is associated with that muscle in order to control it. There are two different types of motor units. They have a, you have a small motor unit which have you, when you have one nerve that controls very few muscle cells and a larger motor unit that controls a bigger group of muscles. Usually the small motor unit are for precise movement like the motions in your hands and your facial muscles and the large motor unit are like the muscles in your thigh, your legs, your muscles in your back, things like that. A neuromuscular junction is a connection between a motor neuron and a skeletal muscle. A synapse is a connection between it could be either a nerve to a nerve or nerve to another organ, but in this specific case, it's a, a connection between a motor neuron and a skeletal muscle. An axon, remember, is the long portion of the neuron that transmits the information from the cell body down to the axonal terminal where it can be sent to wherever it needs to go. Neurotransmitter is a chemical messenger that are stored in the synaptic vesicle in the synaptic bulb which is the, at the end of the uh, axon. When it is triggered this neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is a gap between the neuron and the sarcolemma which is the cell membrane of the muscle cell. And then acetylcholine is a name of the neurotransmitter that is specifically used between a that is used between a connection between a motor neuron and a skeletal muscle because the nerve and the skeletal muscle are not connected because of that synaptic cleft which is the gap in between the two neurotransmitter is needed in order to cross that gap axonal terminals is the end portion of the axon and there could be many different branches of the axonal terminal and at the end of it is an enlarged portion called the synaptic end bulb and that's where the synaptic vesicles are located. Motor end plate is an area on the muscle cell where the is portion of the synapse where the junction between the motor neuron and the muscle is and the motor end plate contains the receptors for the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Here is a long portion of the axon. Notice the branching of the axonal terminals. At the end of each of those axonal terminals are the enlarged portion called the synaptic bulb. When you see one of those synaptic bulbs, you notice that here is the synaptic bulb. Inside it, you have tons of little, tiny little sacs called the synaptic vesicles which contain the neurotransmitters. The outer layer of the synaptic, a synaptic bulb is the neurolemma which is the cell membrane of the neuron. This area in the blue, this is called the synaptic cleft which is the gap between the motor neuron and the muscle. Then this area here which is part of the muscle, skeletal muscle, that is your sarcolemma, which contains the receptors that's going to receive the acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter that is released by the synaptic vesicle in the synaptic bulb. Synaptic bulb. A muscle contraction is initiated by the nerve impulse traveling down the axon. When that nerve impulse reaches the synaptic bulb and causes the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the neurolemma, which is the outer, the cell membrane of the nerve, and it releases the acetylcholine.
Then an acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft, and then it will bind with the receptors on the motor end plate, which will then carry the nerve impulse through the muscle cell. That nerve impulse carried is carried because that attachment or binding of the acetylcholine to the receptors on the motor end plate causes a rush of sodium into the sarcolemma, which generates an electrical current, and this is what's going to cause the muscle contraction. The nerve impulse comes down. It's going to trigger the synaptic vesicle to come and fuse with the neural lemma of the neuron, motor neuron, or the synaptic end bulb. That's going to release the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, into the synaptic cleft. It's going to travel down and bind with the receptors on the motor end plate, which is in the blue. That's going to cause the sodium to enter, and that's going to carry that nerve impulse that was generated by the nerve, the axonal terminal of the nerve, and then travel down the muscle, which causes a muscle contraction. What actually causes a muscle contraction or shortening of the muscle, a theory called, there's a theory called the sliding filament theory. This is when the nerve impulse hits the muscle cells, it causes an action potential. Action potential equals much muscle contraction in skeletal muscle. That nerve impulse will travel down the sarcolemma, which is the cell membrane of the muscle cell. Then it's going to travel down the T-tubules, causing the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release the calcium that's stored in there into the sarcoplasm, which is the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. The calcium will bind to the actin, which is the thin myofilament, and it will expose a binding site for the myosin. The myosin will attach to the actin filament, forming a cross, cross bridge between the actin and the myosin filament. The myosin head will then pull the actin filament towards the end line, which is the middle section of the sarcomere, out past the myosin filament. This action requires energy, the ATP. The ATP is specifically needed for the myosin head to be pulled back, so when it slings back, it will hook onto the actin filament and pull it toward the end line. ATP, which is the energy source, when it splits, it releases the um, energy, and that's going to cause the myosin head to bind with the actin filament. When they bind together, this is what causes the formation of the cross bridge between the the head of the myosin the myosin head and the actin filament. This binding cannot happen unless calcium comes in and exposes the binding site on the actin filament so that this cross bridge can occur. Then powered by the ADP, the energy from the splitting of the ATP, then the myosin head is going to pull the actin filament in the direction toward the M line. Then another ATP is going to come along and bind to the myosin head, which energizes it. That's going to cause the myosin head to come off the actin filament and pull back into um, set position. Then when that ATP splits again, then it's going to hook onto the next area of the actin filament and then pull it again. So it's continuously going to pull the actin filament toward the M line. When that continuously occurs, then the Z lines of the sarcomeres get closer together, and then the sarcomeres shorten, which means that the H zone, which is this middle section here, starts to get narrower. As them. So here is a Z line, here is a Z line. When the actin filaments are pulled toward the M line, the Z line is getting shorter. And then eventually when the muscle is fully contracted, there is no more H zone. So a complete contraction, there is no H zone. In a partially contracted, you can kind of see a narrowing in the H zone. And then in a relaxed muscle, you have a t large uh, H zone. So if you look at the length of the Z line or Z disc on this fully contracted sarcomere and compare that to the relaxed, note, relaxed uh, sarcomere, notice the 
the uh, the length of the sarcomere. So if you have a bunch of sarcomeres doing the, exactly the same thing, the entire myofibril and the entire muscle is contracting or shortening, which causes a muscle contraction. Muscle contraction will continually occur and as long as the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is being released into the uh, synaptic cleft and uh, crossing the, the synaptic cleft. So in order to stop the muscle contraction, there has to be an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that's going to break down acetylcholine and then that will cause the, the action potential or the nerve impulse to stop which will then generate the calcium to go back into the sarcoplasm reticulum and the resting potential, which means that the, the charge that is caused during the action potential comes back up and then now there is no more contraction. 6.3 notes homework. Number one, what roles do the action potential, calcium, and ATP play in muscle contraction? Number two, what happens after the synaptic vesicle fuses with the neural lemma of the neuron? Number three, what causes muscles to relax after contraction?